um, as a PhD student, um, I obviously meet with my supervisors uh, once a week. Um, we normally start with a little bit of small talk. Um, I actually normally spend about five minutes explaining to Radu how um, my, kept, my cats kept me awake all night um, with the Zoomies. Um, I know if there's one person here who will understand that, that's you, Rob Ferguson. Um, me and Leo will sort of do the same, I guess, but one day um, Leo sort of joined our meeting and he said to me, tell me a good marketing tool for the university to encourage enrollment of new students. So, you know, like how do we get more students interested in um, studying science at Essex or just get them in, getting them excited about science in general. Um, and I said to him, like one of the greatest tools that we have is current students, uh, current staff, and best of all, it's a free marketing tool. It's one that um, benefits the university, but uh, more importantly, social media can also benefit you and um, help you um, gain more impact and engagement with your research. So let me start with the uh, unapologetic introduction of me. So uh, the majority of you probably don't know me, uh, don't know who I am. So my name is Olivia Grant. I'm a second year PhD candidate now in the <laughs> genomics group um, and also the Institute of Social and Economic Research, also at Essex. I'm also a visiting student at the Barts of London of Queen Mary University of London, um, as Radu just moved there and obviously is one of my supervisors. Um, the main and interesting thing is that my research interests, um, my research interests uh, are researching the effects of air pollution on our epigenome. Uh, you should definitely contact me if our interests align somehow. I love epigenetics, I love DNA methylation. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to talk about any of that with me, uh, please feel free to do so. I sort of expected my first departmental seminar to, I guess, be about my research, but hopefully um, we'll get there one day and I'll be here <laughs> discussing my research. Um, I'm supervised by Dr. Radu Zabet, um, Leo, and also Professor Mina Kamari in the Institute of Social and Economic Research. Um, but today I obviously wanna discuss social, um, sorry, so, uh, science communication via social media. Um, and I know that there are probably many skeptics in academia and perhaps even some of you on the talk today um, are here because you feel like you have to be um, and you might be a bit of a skeptic when it comes to using social media in academia. Um, so let me just, I guess, remind you that if by the end of my talk you're still not convinced and you're still not interested in um, using social media for science communication, that is okay. I won't be offended uh, just a little bit. I want to stress also that this is not necessary. This is just me discussing my experiences, I guess, and um, things that have worked for me, um, different methods for boosting engagement with my research, etc. So uh, yeah, this quote says, um, oh, I have to move that because I can't even read the quote. I can just see me. Um, so it says, I'm sure there are many reasons why scientists use Twitter, etc but I really struggle to see how advancing their careers is one of them. How exactly does that work? So again, I know this could potentially be a thought that many of you have or um, perhaps had when you read the abstract for my talk today. So obviously this is something that I'm aiming to answer for you today. So let's do a quick overview of using social media as an academic. So the pros and the cons. So pros, um, I'm gonna go through these quite briefly because I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail with each of them. Uh, but the first one is obviously collaboration. Social media allows you to connect with people um, you wouldn't bump into perhaps in your local pub. Um, engagement, it allows you to form valuable connections again with people you're unlikely to bump into in the pub. Uh, dissemination, so what this means is if you wanna connect with the public, um, you should be putting your energy where they spend most of the time, which unfortunately, is the internet nowadays. Um, and some of you might be wondering why do I, why would I wanna connect with the general public? And I'll address that um, soon. And it relates to the next point, which is impact. Um, and then lastly, evidence. So for me, this is a big one. It's a, a form of evidence to back up things that I will potentially write on my CV. So um, it's all well and good, you know, me putting on my CV, I have great communication skills and I'm great at communicating my research, but I guess social media allows me to, um, provide evidence for this. 
um, so yeah, I'll go into a little, like, a little bit more detail on each of these. Um, so if they don't make sense right now, don't worry. <laughs> um, cons, obviously there's um, cons. And I, as I said, I know there's a lot of people who are skept skeptical about using social media um, for science communication. So I didn't wanna just ignore the cons. I know there are some, um, it can take up a lot of your time. Some people can find it um, to overload them. You might be worried about plagiarism, um, harassment, or your image as an academic. So you might be worried like, will this affect how it, future employees might see me? Could it potentially be a distraction from my work? Tons of things. So let's dive in. So um, I'm gonna run through all of this today, why you should bother with social media, what you can gain from social media um, and how to find time for it and how also to use it effectively. Again, these are just my experiences. I don't have tens of thousands of followers, um, but what I can say is that I do have like a very engaging audience with my, um, my posts and my research. What I mean by that is, um, I guess if you have, there's a difference right between having a hundred followers and having no one care about any of your posts. But if you have, um, so there's a difference between having ten, tens of thousands of followers and having no one engage with your post. My personal opinion is that it's better to have 100 followers who actually care and engage with the things that you post as opposed to tens of thousands of followers. So I don't want to focus on how to gain followers or anything like that because I personally don't think it matters. And I don't think you should look at someone's profile and say they've only got 100 followers so no one cares about their stuff because I, I think that's, I disagree with that. I don't think that's um, the way that we should be looking at social media. So why did I start um, using social media for academic purposes? So the biggest thing for me, um, and I guess this is probably more relatable for the students um, in this talk is, I guess like without sounding like um, a victim <laughs> is the isolating feeling that I had. I spent six months, um, the first six months of my PhD and for the rest of my PhD, I've been sat in this bedroom for 40 hours a week um, on my own. And um, I do want to acknowledge that I, I have the best supervisors. They're really, really supportive, of course. Um, but you still sort of miss that connection with other PhD students. So I started my account to connect with other PhD students and also to share what it's really like um, to actually do a PhD. Um, I also wanted to improve my science communication skills and what it's like specifically to be a bioinformatics PhD student. I saw a lot of resources for wet lab students. Um, but less for bioinformatics. So I guess that was sort of the niche that I wanted to fill. Um, and then lastly, obviously I wanted to share my passion for science and my passion for my research with other people. Um, I guess in, in normal times, I could perhaps be talking to some of you in top bar over a beer about my research, but um, obviously I can't do that. So I took to social media to talk to randomers about it instead. And um, it's worked so far, by the way. Um, so when it comes to showcasing and communicating our research or your research, there's two sort of main groups of people that we might need to target. Um, so you, did someone ask a question? No, okay. So there's, there's two main groups, like I said, of people that you um, might be looking to target. You might have people that fall in between these two groups and that's fine, but let's focus on uh, the two main groups. So first we have other academics and other scientists. So this is an obvious one. Um, obviously communicating and spreading your work in academia is extremely important. Um, not only does it advance your career, but it helps advance your field. Um, it can lead to more citations. It can lead to invitations to speak at big or small conferences, um, collaborations, and there's many more benefits to that. Um, Essentially, it just helps you get your papers out there and read and circulated and everything. Um, but then we have the general public. So now, obviously, the general public are unlikely to be reading these academic pa papers. I know that my family don't even know probably what an academic paper is. If I talk to them about it, they have no clue what I'm talking about. Um, so the chances of them reading them are very, very slim. So you need to be where the general public spend most of their time, like I said, and that is the internet. Um, it's super important that we are communicating with and informing the public about our work because essentially um, they're the people who are potentially funding our research, right? So 
if we aren't communicating our research to them in an accessible way, they're not going to care about our research. And why does that matter? Like, why do we want the general public to care about our research? Well, if you think about it, when it comes to uh, policy discussions um, or the government making decisions about research budgets, budgets um, and things like that, if the public aren't making a fuss or they don't care about your particular research area, then you can take a guess where the government are potentially going to make um, research budget cuts. Um, and things like that. Now, I know I'm only a PhD student, so I don't have the best understanding about money and funding in research, but I can be pretty sure that the public understanding your research and caring about your research because you made it accessible to them will lead to an increased chance of you getting funding and making an impact with your research. Now, when it comes to getting our research known, uh, this is a tweet from Dan Quintana, who um, is a really great science communicator. Um, he says there are basically only four ways to get your research known. So number one is to already be famous. Um, so if we take, for example, uh, I hope I pronounce her name right, Greta Thunberg. Um, let's say she published a paper, right? She would immediately get thousands of downloads because people care about what she has to say. Now, unfortunately, I'm not already famous and I don't think anyone in this call is uh, famous. Um, so secondly, you could potentially have a famous mentor. Radio and Leo, you're letting me down. You should be famous. Um, but if you have a famous mentor, you could, um, they could potentially be the one helping to promote your work and getting you connections. Um, and then your research is obviously more likely to be known and spoken about. Uh, the next one, you can repeatedly win the peer review lottery. Now, I haven't experienced this myself because I haven't published yet, but I'm sure some of you uh, probably have. Um, so you might have a really solid paper, a really, really strong paper. Um, but as everyone always says, peer review seems to sort of be luck of the draw in terms of how your paper is gonna be dealt with. So, you know, it depends on things like what reviewers you have, what the editor thinks of you. So that can mean that sometimes um, years of work is in the hands of essentially that one editor, right? Or those free reviewers that are looking at your work. So it really is like a lottery in some way. Um, but then fourth, and um, I would say this is really important for the uh, junior scientists, is to social media. So this is something that we're all in control of. Um, and in science, we have to hold on to these things uh, that we have control over because I don't think it happens very often, uh, but it's something that we're all capable of doing. You know, we all have access to social media um, and its benefits are proven. Um, it gives you a means to connect with people that you wouldn't normally connect with or reach because of the enormous amount of gatekeeping that we have in academia. So it doesn't matter what university you come from, it doesn't matter if like me, you're a PhD student or if you're a professor, um, this is something that you have access to and um, it's something that does work. So, like I said, you, we are all like enormously limited by um, what a handful of people think about our work. So, what I mean by that and what I mean by gatekeeping in academia is that traditionally, if you wanted to get your research known, um, you know, before social media was a big thing, you'd be looking to connect with journalists, perhaps get a radio spot, or even if you're really lucky, uh, a TV opportunity. But how feasible really was this if you wasn't already famous or had a famous mentor? Like how easy was it to actually get this publicity as someone who wasn't already famous? And the answer is probably not very easy at all. Um, so like I said, you, you have perhaps these journal editors or people in charge of recruiting researchers for these traditional media spots um, who perhaps uh, might look at, you know, they might come across you and think, I've never heard of this guy, so I'm not going to bother with, I'm not going to bother with them. Your work might be amazing, but if they don't know you already, they probably wouldn't have given you these opportunities in the past to actually discuss your research in traditional media. Um, and so therefore, obviously, the chance of you getting these opportunities would be super low. But social media is something that's allowing us all to get around these obstacles. 
Um, and it's the same, like I mentioned, when it comes to uh, peer reviewed journals, typically, uh, you know, you submit your paper, right, to the journal, um, the editor then will basically decide if it's worth publishing, you might end up with a desk rejection. Um, but if you're lucky, it will then go on to uh, reviewers. Um, typically, I think it's free. Again, I'm a PhD student, what do I know? I think it's free. <laughs> um, and then the fate of years of years worth of your work is essentially in their hands. This small handful of people deciding if your research is worth sharing with the rest of the research community. Um, so you might have to go through several rounds of revision, uh, but you know, if, like I said, if you're lucky, you'll then have your paper accepted, right? Now this process um, can take around six months, possibly even longer, um, maybe even a year, two years, maybe, maybe some of you can top that. Um, and obviously this is such a long time, right? So sometimes I guess we need the scientific information right away. So I, sorry to bring it up, but let's take coronavirus as an example. Um, we had all of these preprints coming out about coronavirus. Now imagine if we had to wait for all of these papers to go through the peer review process before other scientists had access to them. I guess like we could potentially be weeks or even months behind in our fight um, towards the pandemic right now. Um, obviously I acknowledge that peer review is something that's necessary to make sure that we don't get you know tons of rubbish work being circulated or um, misinformation being circulated in these journals. Um, but I guess it's sort of a case by case situation. You know, these COVID preprints were super useful. And um, I don't know if I'm going to regret saying this, but we see some work, I guess, um, being published in journals that you read and you think, how did this get published? I mean, <clears throat> um, I hope I don't regret saying this, but <laughs> uh, let's remember that paper in Nature Communications about female mentorship, right? Um, now, this is not a case of my feminism coming out because that paper was full of flawed <clears throat> methodology, which should have been picked up by reviewers. But instead, it was picked up by the science community, science community post publishing. So there was all the raves about it on Twitter. Um, I've got ahead of myself here, but um, <laughs> essentially what I'm saying is here is where things like preprint servers can be so handy in helping you get your research out. Um, <clears throat> early, I guess, and push past these obstacles in academia. It allows us to get fast feedback, get our work out there quicker and circulate it quicker. Um, now I touched on misinformation on social media as well. And again, sorry, but coronavirus is a great example. Uh, we have currently with the vaccines, especially tons of misinformation being spread around, corona, uh, around about coronavirus and especially the vaccines. So things like 5G, are there chips in the vaccine? Are the government tracking me? Blah, blah, blah. I could go on for a while. But um, I guess what can we as scientists do about this? Um, we, we directly can educate and communicate, inform the general public about science. And by communicating science publicly, we are sort of like personalizing science, which is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I think that scientists are respected, but the public doesn't perhaps understand much about what we actually do. So by using social media, um, we can, uh, I guess, create like persuasive content that we can uh, target to large audiences really quickly to help sort of like tell the story behind the science and also the research researchers who are carrying the science out. I know there's probably going to be a lot of people who argue about whether it is our job as scientists to be debunking these claims, um, for example, about the vaccine, like turning you into a zombie or whatever, or containing cells from an unborn fetus, which, yes, is actually one that I see very often, um, or whether it's the job of the public themselves um, to educate themselves or the government. Um, and I'm not here to debate that. <laughs> I just want to say that if it's something that you're passionate about, um, contributing towards, then social media can help you do that. Um, and I guess in turn, with that comes a lot more respect and understanding for your own research, which, like I said, can obviously have lots of benefits. Uh, one of my favourite ones, so um, another reason that social media is great, is um, collaboration. Um, and well, the number one thing I say is, don't be scared about reaching out to people. 
um, people are on social media, um, believe it or not to be sociable. So reach out to people and engage with people in your field. Um, I think it's a great tool. And there's a concept on social media, which we refer to as the long tail. So if we think about pre-COVID, I've mentioned COVID so many times, I know that's really annoying. Um, <laughs> If we were down the pub on a Friday night, um, we would find it very easy to um, find someone willing to discuss, um, I don't know, like football or the latest rave on Netflix, which at the moment is Bridgerton, I think. Um, but I, for example, um, am extremely unlikely to find someone in the pub willing to discuss epigenetics with me. And for the implant enthusiasts, um, how many people in your local pub would you find who care about plant science. So here basically is a great example of the beauty of social media. I don't need to worry about trying to find those people um, also interested in epigenetics in the pub because I can easily log online and find these people instantly. There's also the great benefit of going to the pub and not having to talk or think about epigenetics. <laughs> um, so yeah, it allows us to find people who have the same nerdy and boring interests as us. Um, and so I want to just quickly give you an example of this. So I'm obviously really interested in um, air pollution. And for the first couple of months of my PhD, I was looking at um, modeling air pollution. Um, like I said, I'm extremely unlikely to find someone in my local supermarket or down the street who's gonna be able to help me with this. But online, I'd done it very easily. I spoke to a professor from Manchester who pointed me towards several resources, which helped me figure out how to do the particular task that I wanted to do. I spoke to someone from DEFRA about the air pollution maps that I could uh, potentially be using. Um, and I did use them. Uh, so I had some great and useful conversations with them. Conversations which obviously would not have been possible had it not been for social media or me having to find their address and write to them, problem of done. Um, now, the last one that I want to discuss is how social media can help you improve your science communication. And yes, it can help you improve your science communication. Now, for me, um, most of my conversations um, about my research off of social media are very jargon filled scientific conversations. And they'll be with my supervisors or some of my PhD colleagues. But I guess by putting into practice, uh, relaying my research to a lay audience. So this is people who don't know um, what epigenetics is or they don't know anything really about science um, it's helped me to think about and improve the way that I communicate my own research like I said um, these are skills that I can mention in my CV um, but they're also skills that I can show evidence of and prove I'm capable of so um, I didn't really want to show you examples too early on I've got more examples later but I'm this one's here now so I'm going to show you this is a trend going around on um, Instagram at the moment which is where you basically essentially explain your uh, research at five levels. So you'll start with um, a child and you'll sort of go through to expert level. Um, but I, I wanna sort of like point you towards the comments that you can see on this post and about how providing your research uh, at different levels can get people interested and make them engage more with your research. Um, so yeah, this is a really cool trend going around at the moment. And um, I think it's a great example of how you can improve your science communication um, online. So I'll, I'll just quickly flick through these. Um, but this is all on my Instagram. If anyone wants to go and read it, I would appreciate it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see it's started some conversations here about um, DNA methylation um, from a professor uh, from a university in India. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I would love to let you all read it um, because I would love for you all to read about my research, but I'm gonna move on, but it's all on my Instagram if anyone wants to have a look. Um, so what can you gain from social media? You're wondering like, how can you benefit from social media? And so I wanted to start this um, section by reminding you all that I am in my second year of my PhD, which means, oh, not which means, but I have no published papers. And in fact, I, I don't know if Radio or Leo would disagree with me here, but I wouldn't even say that I'm close to publishing one yet, um, but I've still managed to gain these opportunities. So the message there is imagine for people like yourselves with these great research grants and cool papers that are coming out, imagine what kind of outreach you could be doing and what cool opportunities uh, you could be getting. 
So opportunities uh, uh, that I've gained include being on uh, two podcasts with um, Ellie Watson, who's also a PhD student in the genomics group. Um, we were invited onto two podcasts by people who had seen our posts on social media and some reason thought we were worth talking to. Um, YouTube videos, we've discussed our research on platforms like YouTube, which is a website called, um, used by millions of people. Um, I've done guest posts on other people's accounts um, and social media. Uh, so I've put on the right there, uh, I was invited to do a guest post on an environmental account that allowed me to target my research towards people outside of the science community or, or genetics community, I guess. Um, and target it towards people who had um, a direct interest in climate change and environment. Um, and as a result of that, I got a large following from that account. Um, and I had some really great discussions and they're people who I still talk to and they're excited for my research to come out and they're excited for what I might find in my research. Um, because it will essentially help them in their campaigning towards uh, fight, fighting climate change. Um, so you can see that social media is all about finding ways which you can collaborate with people in a win-win way, right? She got like a, a free, easy post. She didn't have to do anything. I did all the writing for it. Um, and I got a new following and I was able to target a different audience to what I would normally be targeting. Um, really quickly as well, I've, I've recently done a blog post for Hello Bio about my research. And um, I also like just regularly talk to um, two journalists who um, regularly write about air pollution, um, who I sort of connected with as a result of my posts about my research. Um, I've touched on some skills that I've gained from being on social media. And I wanted to show you some examples of posts that I've created to help me communicate my science and educate um, even other scientists about my research area. Um, so, yeah, this is just me basically uh, discussing epigenetics and doing it in a way that is accessible and interesting. Again, this is like what I mentioned about personalizing my research. I put a little, I don't, wouldn't call that cute, but a picture of me and my twin. Um, again, pay attention to the comments. These are other scientists um, and um, from presenting my research in a way that it's accessible, um, they've you know, got interested in epigenetics and they're interested in learning more from me about that. Um, so before I discuss perhaps how um, or different ways that you can use social media, I wanted to, I guess, show you the kind of numbers of people that you can reach using social media. So these are screenshots from my own profile, which allow me to like see how many people have seen my posts on my profile. Now I apologize if this like seems like I'm just shoving my content at you and uh, really shamelessly self promoting myself. That's not the aim of the talk. I'm just trying to demonstrate to you that social media is worth it and it does work. You can see that I got like 180 profile visits from one post. My post reviews like 265,000 times in one month. Uh, there's 31,000 views on one post and my posts gen like generally take me about 10 minutes to make. I don't spend too much time on them. Um, so let's discuss the ways that you can communicate online. So we have these four traditional ways of communicating. The first is audio and this was typically or it's typically been done in the past through um, radio, like I mentioned earlier. Um, secondly, we have text. Um, so this is mainly done through Twitter, blogs, personal websites and Facebook. Then we have images, um, and I guess this is where you can include some of the infographic type of posts, which I've just shown um, that you can share. And then lastly, we have videos, which has traditionally been done through um, the TV. Um, now, something I felt um, I was taught, and I'm really sorry for the Twitter enthusiasts, because I know for sure there's some Twitter enthusiasts here. But I was sort of taught and felt that it was the only way or, or platform, I guess, that you can use for science communication. But what does Twitter actually allow or best facilitate for you to do? Um, and that was really badly worded. What does Twitter um, promote, I guess, or make it very easy for you to do is only text. Um, I know that it lets you post the other methods. I know it lets you post pictures or videos or things like that, but I guess, compared to text it has very little engagement compared to the other platforms so if you're someone who 
like me uh, particularly doesn't enjoy the interface, the look or just the general use of Twitter like me, I wanted to just show you some other platforms that you can use for science communication. So we have the boom in academic podcast replacing traditional radio. Um, so these are things that you can listen to while you're in the lab, while you're driving or you're just doing the dishes or whatever. Um, you have this platform called called Anchor, which you can basically start an academic podcast uh, from scratch for free. And that's one bit easy to do. Um, we have sites like WordPress, which allow you to formulate and make your own blog or website to discuss your research. My personal favorite, obviously, is Instagram for sharing images, um, infographics, and videos. Um, and Instagram, like I said, is a platform from which experience I can say has very high engagement. Um, so, what I mean by that is it's got a lot of like interactive features. And then lastly, the rise of TikTok. I know TikTok is perhaps one of those platforms you would never associate with social media, but I'll tell you in a minute why I started using it to drive traffic towards my academic profile. Um, I want to acknowledge that these platforms are likely to change. The popular social media platforms are always changing and they're always at risk of disappearing. So for those of you who remember Bebo will know about this. I remember being like 14 and like begging my parents for a Bebo account so I could be like my best friend's other half. Some of you will know what I'm talking about, but some of you will just think, what is this girl talking about? Um, but you also had, you know, like MySpace um, and all the other ones that I guess disappeared. Um, but I guess it's worth remembering that the ways you communicate are unlikely to change. So don't get too hung up on the idea that Instagram might not be around in a couple of years, because if you keep thinking like that, I guess you're never really going to get started um, because the platforms are always changing. Like I said, um, something I quickly want to mention is that it's worth directing your uh, traffic from any of your social medias to a blog that's what I've just started doing because I feel that blogs and personal websites are always going to be around right the platforms might change but the blogs and websites are always going to be there so perhaps it's worth directing all of your traffic from your social media to a blog um, but that requires maybe a little bit more effort to keep a blog up and running um, so I know at this point, there's a lot of you thinking, what do I post? I have nothing to post. And I could have easily adopted the same attitude as a first year PhD student when I started my profile. Um, I have no papers and I didn't have obviously any papers in sight really at the time. And if I had thought like that, I guess I would have missed out on all of the opportunities that I've had so far. So one thing I really want to get across is that my personal feeling, and um, it's also shown in this tweet, is that if you think you should only be posting your papers or your achievements, um, I've discussed a lot with Ellie, you know, like when we go down, I scroll down my timeline on Twitter, all I see is, look at my new paper, look how great I am, look at this new um, grant that I got, and it's all good. But I think if you're looking to only tweet things like that, you're only going to be tweeting like every few months. I wouldn't have made one tweet yet because I haven't, you know, I haven't had any of those milestones where I've published a paper or got like a really big grant or anything. I'm an, I'm an early career scientist. So I, if I thought like that, I wouldn't have anything to post, of course. So I guess this links to the title of my talk today, um, which is obviously science is a story. There's a process um, along the exciting and I think interesting process that we have to go through in order to formulate and write these papers. So why not share that with people? If you do this, people are more likely to be, I guess, interested in the end result anyway, and they're more likely to promote and download that paper um, or preprint um, when you eventually are able to publish it. So now I want to talk about how to effectively use social media and show you some examples of things that I post, like I said, um, because I, as a non-published student, if I can find stuff to post, I'm so sure you guys can find um, cooler things to post than I, I can. Um, the first is that many accounts use a, a branding approach to their profiles. So you would have noticed that throughout my talk, I've used a running color theme throughout my presentation. And also if you follow me on any social media, you'll know that um, I always use uh, this color theme throughout all of my, um, my stuff. And it's a really great proven technique to help you be consistent and recognizable across different platforms. So if someone goes from my Instagram to my Twitter, they'll sort of immediately recognize those colors, I guess, and associate the two. Um, the next one is just to keep your profile simple. 
provide key information really easily. So this can involve things like your name, uh, what you do. So obviously put PhD candidate, um, what uh, institutions I'm associated with. So where, where I'm working basically. Um, I also put my supervisor's names um, and what, what lab I'm part of because um, I'm proud to be part of those labs. So I, I put them in there as well. I put my research interest so people immediately know what I study and um, they um, know that if if our research interests align. Um, so if someone's interested in uh, air pollution, they can follow me and we can chat about things like that. Um, I also wanted to let you know about this really cool uh, tool called Linktree, which I don't know if many people will be aware of, but it is a really cool one. And it basically just essentially allows you to put all of your links into one link, which you can have on um, your profile. Um, so here I've put all of my links. Um, so this includes my, uh, my podcast, um, which I run with Ellie Watson, um, and I'll show you in a second. Um, and the links to all of my other social medias um, for my academic profiles. Um, and of course, I have to mention hashtags. Use relevant hashtags in your posts to help people find and interact with you. If you're not on social media, hashtags are basically, um, you just put like a weird little number sign before the word and people can search them. And so if someone went and searched for enhancers, for example, on this tweet, um, this tweet would, um, sorry, if someone went and searched for enhances on Twitter, this tweet would pop up and um, they could potentially go and go onto our profile and then maybe start listening to our podcast just from using that hashtag. Um, so yeah, there's an example tweet there. Um, make sure you're only using relevant hashtags. Don't hashtag every single word, um, but I feel like you guys probably know about that. Um, I mentioned as well Instagram and TikTok and I wanted to show you some examples of things that can be posted there. Um, I hope I'm going to be able to play these videos and it's not going to deafen you all. These days a small cut is nothing to worry. These days a small cut is nothing to worry about. If it becomes infected the doctor will give you an antibiotic to treat it. But what if I told you that in the near future effective antibiotics might be hard to come by. Bacteria are evolving ways to avoid being killed by our clinically used antibiotics. They become resistant. As an organic chemist, my research is tackling this problem by trying to overcome this resistance. This can be done by chemically modifying existing antibiotics or by developing new ones. These days, a... So yeah, that was a really great example of putting your research down into a 15 to 30 second video. Um, we all know how bad our attention span is. I know that mine is awful on social media. If I see a large amount of text, I don't want to read it. I do enough reading in the day anyway, so I don't want to do it on social media as well. So these are really great examples. Um, I mentioned TikTok and how I'm using it to drive traffic to my um, academic Twitter and Instagram. Um, so I post actually, um, so some of you may cringe at this, so I apologize, but I post day in the life videos, um, which I'll, I'll play for you in a second, which essentially just takes people through what I do in a day. Um, and uh, people, a lot of people from this TikTok video have come to my academic Instagram and they're now reading about my research. And the thing with TikTok is that it's so easy to get like a crazy amount of likes um, or, um basically just to go viral on tiktok is very easy so let me just quickly show you this this video sorry i was just checking there was no one in the chat um there's no audio on this but essentially i'm doing a voiceover where i'm just showing people what i do during the day And I got a lot of uh, actually comments on this video um, and people messaging me on Instagram, asking me um, to talk a little bit more about bioinformatics and um, genomics in general and my research. So that is an example of something that I post. I'll show you this last video. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Maria, a second year PhD student at the National Horizon Centre and my PhD is looking at the role of mitochondria in Parkinson's disease. Wow, what a bad diagram of a brain. <laughs> um, so how am I doing this? Well, I'm looking at fruit flies which have 70% of the same genes as humans, one of which is Parkin, a Parkinson's gene. So I'm doing some behavioural assays to see exactly what's going on. Basically, I'm crossing in a mitochondria mutation and seeing how that affects the flies that have the Parkin mutation. What will be next? Well, that'll be looking at the molecular mechanisms. So yeah, that's me and my research in a nutshell. Hi. 
these days a small cut um okay yeah so that was just in a, some examples of um uh people putting their research down into 30 second videos um i mentioned that me and ellie have started a podcast and um, this is another really great way of um interacting with people in your field i would highly 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 recommend starting an academic podcast um it gives you basically if you think about it you're reading all of these papers anyway right we have to all read papers this is just a really fun way of doing it and it also puts you in direct contact with the authors of these papers um who um you could then build um i guess engagement and um relationships with which is only going to be beneficial to you in the future this is our one if anyone i'm doing a shameless self-promotion here but if anyone wants to um listen to it we're on spotify blah blah, blah. um it's all in my link tree uh, which you can find on my twitter um i'm only going to go for about five more minutes don't worry um but i just want to quickly go over finding time for social media um and talk a little bit about picking the right platform i think you should match the effort um required for the platform to the amount of effort that you want to put in so twitter LinkedIn, these kind of um, social medias require very low effort. Essentially, you're just thinking out loud, like you can just, whatever you're thinking, you can just go and tweet it and things like that. If you wanna use a platform, um, if you wanna put a little bit more effort into it, I would suggest using a platform like Instagram or TikTok or something like that. They take a little bit more effort to make these videos. Um, so I would match the effort that you wanna put in with the platform. But if anyone like wants to discuss more about this, I'm happy to discuss it in the questions or another time, but I, I'm aware there's some people who won't care. So I'm not gonna go too much into it. Um, don't force yourself to post um, quality over quantity. So if you only wanna post once every two weeks, make it a great post instead of posting once every single day and then being useless. Reuse content, everything I post on my Instagram, uh, video wise, I post onto TikTok. Um, so I'm essentially not doing any extra work. I'm just posting it all onto TikTok. Um, and schedule a posting time if you feel that you need to. Um, it reminds you to get the post done and um, you don't have to worry about it any other time of the day. You've got a, a specific time that you've blocked out for it. Um, my last few general tips, post accessible content, make it easy for people not in your field to understand what you're talking about. Engage with other people's content. If you engage with other people, they're more likely to engage with yours. So reply to tweets, um, comment on people's stuff and build relationships, I guess. Be, I've spelt that wrong, that's not great. Be open to receive criticism. Um, you get a lot of criticism and it's online, so don't be too upset by it. Um, be consistent, think out loud is a great tip as well. Don't worry too much about, you know, like what you're posting, just think out loud. You know, if you're um, wondering about, I don't know, a particular method and you want some advice on it, just post it and um, see what engagement you get. The last thing is provide value or entertainment. Um, I have had the life sucked out of me during a PhD, so I have no entertainment to give. So instead I provide value um, and it gives people another reason to follow me. So I post like, um, I post these on my blog as well, just um, general things about PhD life in general and tips and tricks, I guess. And um, a lot of people follow me for this. They then um, coincidentally end up seeing my research. Um, so it's a really great way to direct more traffic to your profiles is to make sure that you're providing value or entertainment. Um, good for you if you can provide entertainment, I probably can't. Um, and I've gone through them. Don't forget um, references, make sure you reference everything. Um, just because it's not a journal doesn't mean that you shouldn't reference. You should mention limitations of studies and findings which you discuss. Um, especially when you're relaying it to a lay audience. Um, I think it's really important that you still mention the limitations uh, when sharing your own opinion, make sure you state that. Support junior researchers, female colleagues and minority groups um, on social media. And lastly, have fun. Don't do anything you wouldn't want your PI to see. Um, and for those of you who are not students, don't do anything you wouldn't want Leo to see. Um, I've put some example profiles here. I'm happy to send around these slides for anyone who wants them. Um, so you could look a little bit more into these profiles. Um, for the students, we are doing a podcast episode on everything I've spoke about in a little bit more detail with um, these two PhD students from other universities. Uh, yeah, time for me to stop rambling, rambling, take any questions. Let's have a discussion about social media. This is a QR code towards my uh, link tree. If anyone wants to connect with me on any socials. Yeah, that's everything from me.
feel free to ask any questions. Thanks, Liv, that was fantastic. Thank Come you. on, audience, make with the questions. <laughs> hey, Liv, it's Ali, I got my camera off. Hello. <laughs> Hello, honestly, just wanted to say this was honestly so great. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I think you're you're like a natural doing stuff like this. So uh, obviously well done and well done for everything like the Instagram page and the podcast. I'm so impressed. And it's so clear that you're very passionate about what you do. Oh, and thank you. Very you. Very yeah. All of these available platforms to grow your network and to grow your connections. So well done. And well done to Ellie too, because I know that you guys do some stuff together. So well done, guys. Honestly, so good. Thank you so much, Ali. I appreciate that. So Liv, on Instagram, uh, do you have <clears throat> do you have any um, feel for what proportion of your audience is um, is academics? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I actually do polls on my Instagram quite a lot, and I ask um, who's academic and who's not. Um, I normally get like 75% of them are academics. Um, some people are from industry. Some people are just general public who are not in academia and they're just interested, like I said, perhaps in um, environmental things like climate change. Um, so I guess it would depend from uh, profile to profile, um, but the majority of mine are academics, yeah. And hi, hi, Liv. That was absolutely brilliant. I loved it. Thank you. Um, I, um, I must say, like, I'm quite active on Twitter, and we, I've, um, we've been talking, kind of, as a department as well about starting to use Instagram. And I must say, it's a bit intimidating. So um, it was really great to see the way that you've used it. Mm -hmm. So, have you got any advice for, for instance, our department on moving over to Instagram because? It sounds like you, um, one of the things I think the comms department was nervous about is that you need content. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to put things up. And mm -hmm. we weren't sure that we'd be able to maintain that. So what are your thoughts on that? I think um, as a department, there would be endless content that you could post. Every single person like in the department, PhD student or not, mm. um, Leo and me, we both could, you know, we could both make content I guess it would just be a case of deciding what kind of content you want to put out there do we want to promote like the research going on at Essex or do you want to promote um I don't know perhaps the courses and my advice on that would be not to bother promoting the courses and I know that sounds really silly but I think a lot of um so I, I do follow quite a few um accounts from universities yeah. so um universities that have life sciences accounts and one thing I've noticed is they have like a very low following because they tend to just sort of use it as come and study at our university but nobody wants to see that people want to know what people are actually doing right they actually want to like it's like I said you have to provide value or entertainment yeah. so I would say as a department the best thing to do would be to um, perhaps do interviews with individual um, people in uh, PhD students or um, professors and personalize the page instead of just having it as this is our organize organizations page. It can be like, come to this page and you can read about what this person's doing and this PhD student is researching this. So I think it's a lot of it and success of any page comes down to personalization yeah. and providing value and entertainment. But I'm like, I would be happy to um, I guess talk to people and help people start up Instagrams and stuff. If anyone, yeah, I was I was actually going to say that um, I would love to talk to you like off obviously offline about this because I think that your experience would be a great um, you know give us real good insight. So thank you for that. Yeah, no worries. I'm happy to do that. Thank. <laughs> Um, I'm not entirely sure if you've already said this because like my internet's a bit spotty, but I was just wondering like when did you start interacting with like the scientific community through social media? Just because like 
I don't know how it is for anyone else, but, but for me personally, it's like incredibly daunting because I'm only a master's research student. So I feel like I know nothing compared to other people. Yeah. So this is exactly why I preferred Instagram. Again, sorry to the Twitter enthusiasts, but to where I find personally is full of professors and it's full of people who know what they're talking about. Whereas Instagram is more of a, it's, I don't want to say it's a nicer community, but I feel it's a nicer community. Um, so I've been using Instagram for around six months and um, I just started communicating my research. Um, I, I think like two months after I had my account, originally I was using my account just for PhD related stuff and not my research, but I guess I just saw a lot of other people using it for science communication. And that's when I started um, doing the same thing. But I would say if you're nervous about it, Instagram is the place to start 100%. And from using Instagram, I've definitely got a little bit more confident and trying to use Twitter a little bit more. Um, so I would definitely say start with Instagram um, and don't be nervous about it. You know, as long as you provide references and you don't just make content within like three minutes, um, you have to make sure that you're happy with the content then just have fun with it and don't worry about it too much is my best advice that I could give, I guess. Um, but I do understand what you mean about it being Dalton. Um, I do agree with that and I felt the same way, but you have to start or you're never gonna start, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Ollie. Can I ask you something? So one of the things that uh, one of the reasons why I'm in Twitter only is, as you say, because in principle it's it's ideal for for sending out uh, text and perhaps links and things like that, and you don't really need to work very hard to produce content, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, you seem to be clearly a very good fan of Instagram, um, and I, I was wondered what how is it to post what sort of post do you do you do in, in Instagram because um, it seems to be driven by images right and I well I sometimes have microscopy images that I could send but I, I, I've always been worried like like Michelle was just saying how often can I produce content so that it is worth a while because if you're just going to post once once every two months it may be just not, not worth at all so but, but I've noticed that some of your posts have a lot of text as well so what do you consider a like, a, a, what are the posts that have worked well for you? So posts that work best for me are posts of myself or posts of my desk. And um, <laughs> I'm taking away your excuse of having nothing to post because at least you have microscope images. I have a desk and that's it. Well, that, that's what I, I, mean, I guess you can post networks and things like that, which can be attractive. But, uh, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so when I say images, um, that includes infographics, so yeah. uh, like Im like text on images, and I find that they do amazingly well, and I'm so guilty for this as well. If I see a long caption, I am scrolling past. But the thing with Instagram is it allows you to provide, like have um, like infographics, which you can slide through, and they're prettier to look at than just black and white text. So that's why I prefer Instagram, because I engage with the content a little bit more as opposed to just right. text but um i wouldn't worry about yeah if i can find um pictures to post you definitely can <laughs> all right and can, can something else related a little bit to this because you've, you've mentioned this idea of engaging with two different audiences right mm -hmm. and uh uh, and God, God forgive me, but I'm going to say the word branding. So if you if you have, so as I mostly interact with all the scientists in, in, in Twitter, right? If I wanted to, and I, I've always thought, well, perhaps I could try to do a little bit more of outreach or, you know, science communication to, to the lay audience. And I, I know people who, who do both from the same account because they have a very large following. But uh, how how is it? It, I always found it maybe a little bit dangerous to start trying to do science communication from a from an account that has all, only been interacting with other scientists, right? So how how do you balance the you know, keeping both our audiences interested from the same account? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely um, it's definitely a difficult one, and I understand uh, what you're saying. On my personal one, I do try to keep it more to a general audience. 
um, and I have these other avenues which people can go and breed a boar if they want. So I keep it very simple, but then I say, so for example, last week I did a post on histone modifications. And last week we also did a podcast with Jareth about histone modifications. So I'll say, here is a basic um, overview of histone modifications. And if you wanna learn more, go and listen to my podcast about it. So I, I think I keep the content quite basic and accessible, but it the option is there to go and hear more about it if you're really interested in a little bit more of the nitty gritty of histone modification. That's the way that I, it's worked for me and that's the way that I do But then you do, compart you do compartmentalize your accounts in a way for different functions. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course you have to, yeah. Definitely. I think it's just finding the balance for you and depending on how many different platforms you want to have. I think it's just picking what's going to work best for you because it's going to be different for everyone, right? Um, can I suggest something to Joaquin? Because uh, <laughs> um, so I'm a first year undergraduate. So you've taught us um, genetics, and um, that one lecture that was missed timetabled, and uh, we were all worried. But you were in the lab tending to your flies. Um, so the thing is. Uh, you could use your Instagram for it. So as Michelle said, she wanted to set up a departmental Instagram. So if you're um, unsure about what you want to post um, initially, you could start off on the departmental Instagram and you could um, start your uh, post there and maybe just post a picture of the Drosophila or something you're researching. Because after you mentioned it, I know a lot of people were interested in knowing what you're doing with the flies. And if first years are interested, I'm sure everyone else would be interested as well. So um, yeah, you should probably just, you know, just start it. Maybe ask Michelle and create a departmental one because um, I don't know about the others, but like um, a lot of first years do want to know what everyone's doing. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I guess that comes back to the whole share the process to the paper and not just the paper. Um, because I'd also be interested in what you do with your flies. I mean, I hear your seminars and the, um, your talks in the genomics seminars, but I don't really know what goes into that. So that's all right. right. Uh, Liv. I have a question. Uh, so you mentioned Twitter being mainly used for uh, 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 using text, but it's uh, quite popular now to also include images on Twitter, especially graphs and figures from papers. So do you think there, uh, what's your opinion on the balance of using text and uh, figures and videos on Twitter? Uh, I, so I, my hypothesis is that the infographics have made it to Twitter because of Instagram, because people see how well they perform on Instagram. But um, I think that's a great question. You're, so I noticed that like, when you shared your last thread on your paper with Patrick, actually, you put some um, images in there. So I don't know how you think they performed, but I, I think perhaps on Twitter. I don't know, I'm not an expert. I'm really bad with Twitter. Um, I'm actually trying to use it a little bit more, but I guess I can only say what I would do. If I was to publish a paper tomorrow, I would definitely include um, an infographic on Twitter, but probably mainly text on Twitter. But I feel like that's a really bad answer to that question, but I'm just not that great. And I, I'm still trying to figure out what works on Twitter and what doesn't. I guess. Okay, but on Insta, uh, uh, Instagram, you would definitely use uh, infographics. 100%, yep. 100%. Okay. Because the thing is on Instagram, so you can swipe through them, whereas on Twitter, you can only add a picture to each bit of the thread, right? So mm -hmm. people would have to keep clicking on the new image, whereas on Instagram, they just swipe through it. So that's why I would say maybe one image. Am I wrong? Correct, Livy. Am I wrong? Correct, Levy, you, you, Am I wrong? you, you can't. Have... You can put several pictures in the same in the same tweet. Right, but you can't swipe through them. You have to close them and reopen. Whereas on Instagram, you can swipe through them, um, which probably still works. I don't know. JQ's checking in now. Fact check. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just. I I, I, I want to check. <laughs> Maybe you can. I'm not. I'm not too sure. But um... uh, and uh, for. Um... 
for Instagram, is there a, li a limit on the number of words? Because that's the main limitation of Twitter. You have yeah. uh, few characters. Most of the time, you're gonna do some grammar errors, but you know what? <laughs> what gets the text uh, uh, in there? So, do you have these limitations on Instagram? No, Instagram is so much better for that. You can put two thousand two hundred characters, I think. Okay. Whereas on Instagram, I, I believe it's either 180 or 220. Again, the Twitter enthusiasts are going to correct me, but I think like Instagram is nearly like 10 times more. You can put tons more um, text on Instagram, definitely. So that's another plus side to it. You don't have to try and summarize your paper and years of worth of work in 220 characters. <laughs> exactly. Okay, thanks, Liv. That was great. Um, any further questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. You can come with your.